Welcome back, horror fans, cinephiles, and Jallo enthusiasts. This is Tanner Leeser, your host for all things Jallo here on The King in Jallo. Our next stop on our journey through Jallo Cinema is The Fourth Victim, released in 1971. In this video, I will do a deep dive overview, then segue into a full review and jally tally. The overview will be spoiler free, the review and jally tally will not. Here is The Fourth Victim Overview. The Fourth Victim, also called Death at the Deep End of the Swimming Pool and The Fourth Mrs. Anderson, is a Spanish and Italian co-production. The film is directed by Eugenio Martin, who also co-wrote the film along with C.B. Guilford, Vicente Coelho, Santiago Moncado, and Sabatino Chiofini. Music is by Piero Omeliani. The cast is played by Carol Baker as Julie Spencer, Lillian Martin, Michael Craig as Arthur Anderson, Miranda Campa as Felicity Downing, Jose Luis Lopez Vasquez as Inspector Dunphy, Marina Malfatti as Julie Spencer, and Manuel Gallardo as Dr. Shepard. The plot centers around Mr. Arthur Anderson, a wealthy man, particularly after the unexpected deaths of his three wives in the past few years, which has allowed him to collect more than 165,000 pounds from their life insurance. He is put on trial at the behest of the insurance company, but found not guilty. The superintendent at New Scotland Yard, Inspector Dunphy, is unconvinced that Mr. Anderson is innocent and says he will keep an eye on him. Soon enough, a mysterious woman shows up at Mr. Anderson's house and seemingly tries to escalate a romance, but Arthur is suspicious regarding the woman's true intentions. Was she sent here by somebody? Will there be a fourth victim? The Fourth Victim is one of these films in which half the room will proclaim that it is not a giallo, while the other half asserts that it is. Now, I am not one to make the claim that, like Irish whiskey, a giallo must be made in Italy by Italians. As many of us are aware, the Spanish have their own run of giallo thrillers. I will say regarding this movie that, with its lack of nudity and violence, I can understand the detractors. Also, that it more resembles the structure of Alfred Hitchcock's Suspicion, 1941, than it does the average Jello. But an ongoing theme of our exploration in this channel is what the hell even is the average Jello? At this point of our dive into the genre in the early part of 1971, we have seen a plethora of different types of movies which could all fall under the umbrella of Jello cinema. Carol Baker continues her reign as a star in European thriller films, taking a short hiatus from working with Umberto Lenzi to make this one-off, but she will be back again working with the master for Knife of Ice, 1972. She puts in another good performance. Her character in this one doesn't seem as helpless or at the mercy of the plot as she does in previous Jally. Well, for the most part. Michael Craig is the very likable Mr. Anderson, who you spend the majority of the film wondering whether he could possibly have gotten away with murder three times, and whether a fourth murder will follow. He got his start in theater, and his first job was an assistant stage manager. He would transition to film in the late 40s, early 50s. He began to appear in numerous films after the rank organization took him under their wing. The managing director there believed soon enough that Craig would become an international star. Craig received a BAFTA Best Actor nomination for his role in Sea of Sand, 1958. Although international success wasn't quite in the cards, Craig still went on to act in dozens of films and television roles and would even go on to be a screenwriter. In this movie, Craig's Mr. Anderson is so likable to the point that I said during the viewing that I don't care if he is guilty. Even if he is, I want him to get away with it. He's not unlikable. Even if he definitively did kill his wives. In the context of the movie, I kind of want him to, to get away with it. And 
part of my saying that is because of the character who is Mr. Anderson's foil, the superintendent of New Scotland Yard, Inspector Dunphy, played by Jose Luis Lopez Vasquez. I will recognize that he is the most acclaimed actor in this movie. He was a beloved comedic performer throughout the Franco era of Spain. He has a list of film, theater, and television roles spanning from 1943 to 2007, and his awards for acting could take up an entire video of their own. However, I particularly don't think his comedy lands in this film, and I think he comes off as a very annoying and pestering self-righteous cop who is not above breaking and entering and presuming to search a house without a warrant. My cliche, useless police or comedic police detective exists because of characters like this. Marina Malfatti appears as the mysterious Julie Spencer and had previously appeared in Run Psycho Run, 1968. She would go on to appear in several more Jello films, including The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave, 1971, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, 1972, All the Colors of the Dark, 1972, and The Red Queen Kills Seven Times, 1972. The director, Eugenio Martin, was born in 1925 in the northern African Spanish city of Ceuta. In the vibrant tapestry of 1960s cinema, Martin seized the opportunity to collaborate with European film crews flocking to Spain for its affordable shooting locations. Partnering with esteemed directors like Nicholas Ray, he delved into directing films with international casts and crews, immersing himself in the diverse landscape of cinematic talent. In 1966, Martin made his mark with The Bounty Killer, later known as The Ugly Ones in the US. This western gem not only cemented his reputation, but also left a lasting legacy with its dialogue sampled in the RZA track, Ode to Django, featured in Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained. Martin proudly claimed his film's influence on Sergio Leone's For a Few Dollars More, a testament to his vision and foresight. Venturing into musicals and giallo films, Martin showcased his versatility, earning him the title of an auteur in every genre. His proficiency in English caught the attention of American producer Philip Jordan, leading to collaborations on notable films like Bad Man's River, Pancho Villa, and Horror Express. While critics may have been divided, fans cherished these works, particularly drawn to the stellar performances of Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. However, Martin's international prominence waned after his 1973 film, A Candle for the Devil, retitled It Happened at Nightmare Inn in North America. Following this, his focus shifted to Spanish language television, marking a significant transition in his career trajectory. In a poignant tribute, Martin was honored at the 7th Almeria Western Film Festival in 2017, commemorating the 50th anniversary of his film El Precio de un Hombre. 1967. It stood as a testament to his enduring legacy in the realm of cinema. But I digress. On to the review. Spoilers ahead for those of you who haven't yet seen the film. You've been warned. My prediction for the movie's Jally Tally score. At the time of writing this, I haven't yet seen the movie, and my guess is based off of some of the pushback I have read regarding why this movie is not exactly a giallo. For the lack of nudity and lack of violence, I will therefore guess between 350 to 400 points. Well, let's begin the jally tally and review portion of the video, beginning as always with the previewing cliches. The repeat offenders are one point for actor, three for writer, three for composer, and five for director. Carol Baker was in A Quiet Place to Kill, So Sweet, So Perverse, Orgasmo, and The Sweet Body of Deborah. Four points. Marina Malfatti was in Run, Psycho, Run. One point. Santiago Moncado co-wrote Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Three points. And Piero Umiliani composed for Five Dolls for an August Moon and Orgasmo. Six points. Cliché points for the title, The Fourth Victim, contains a number, five points. First look, 
I am going to add this cliche. We have 10 points for the Spanish director and an additional 15 points for the movie releasing during the golden age of Jalo cinema. And would you look at that, it is already plot o'clock. Hot damn, right out the gate we have a cold open, five points. And Z is for Zoom, five points. This is Felicity. She is the maid to this man here, Arthur Anderson, and his wife out here, Gladys, who's doing her best impression of an OC housewife. I want to stop and show you how similar Piero Omeliani's score is in this movie to his one in Five Dolls for an August Moon. No complaint, I just noticed it. As Felicity rides her bike onto the property, we notice that Gladys is very much knocked out as her cigarette begins to burn her finger. Art featured, five points. As Felicity walks outside, ready to begin her workday, she is met with the unfortunate task of having to fetch Mr. Anderson so he can fish his wife out of the pool. They move her into bed where they dry her off and dress her so she can look halfway decent for her death certificate. I will go back and add extra points for Z is for Zoom for a Zoom on a dead or dying victim. Another five points. Once she is good and proper, Arthur calls a physician, I assume. T is for telephone, five points. As he signs up the certificate of death, the doctor cannot help but be suspicious of the coincidence. After all, this is Mr. Anderson's third wife to meet her demise in a very short period. Arthur and Felicity give each other looks. P is for priest, five points. And funeral, two points. This doofus here is Inspector Dunphy. He orders the body to be dug up at once at the behest of the magistrate, then finds Mr. Anderson so he may serve him the same order and inform him that he is charged with the suspicion of murder of his wife by the insurance company he has drawn up all his life insurance policies with. This scene is where the audience and Inspector Dunphy learn that Arthur has been married three times in total, as this grave here belongs to one of his previous wives. Extra points for funeral for a character learning new information. Three more points. Urban locales, two points. Foreign locales, London, five points. Arthur is at the Central Criminal Court on trial for murder. The senior forensics officer of New Scotland Yard gives his testimony that he discovered from the post-mortem that Gladys Anderson, to his estimation, had drowned in the pool after succumbing to a comatose state from a lethal overdose of the barbiturate seconal. Character takes prescription pills or sedatives. Five points. The next testimony is from the managing director of the insurance company who had requested the investigation, Mr. Mitchell. He states that Mr. Anderson Anderson has now been widowed three times and has collected life insurance on each deceased wife. 5,000 pounds, 40,000 pounds, and now 120,000 pounds. The circumstances of the previous deaths were a car crash due to faulty brakes, and the second died from falling from a building under construction which she was visiting with Mr. Anderson. And lastly, that the overdose of his recent wife was the result of barbiturates that he had bought. Exposition dumping, two points. During the cross-examination, Mr. Anderson admits that he gave the cause of death as drowning because that is what he supposed was the truth and that he was afraid that his other wives had died of accidents and before being cut off, he can be assumed that he was going to say that he was afraid that his recent wife may have taken her life. This reason he also admits why he wanted to avoid a post-mortem. He is asked whether he loved his wives at the time of marrying them, which he states, Yes, but also answers the next question that he did not love them around the times of their deaths. Q is for questions, five points. Felicity Downing is then called in for her testimony. Ms. Downing says that after 15 years of service, she has no reason to believe that her employer would ever kill any of his wives. She states that Gladys became addicted to barbiturates quickly after her marriage and that she and Mr. Anderson ceased any affections towards each other and confesses that he slept in a different room. The prosecution rests, but she has more to say to the court. She states that the fault of Gladys's death is hers, as she had found Gladys attempting to take a whole bottle of Seconal recently and had stopped her and threatened to tell Mr. Anderson, but Gladys had begged her not to. And so she didn't, but her silence she blames as the cause of Gladys's eventual death. The verdict is read, and Mr. Anderson is found not guilty. 
Arthur is out walking free. He is noticed by Inspector Dunphy, whose wife is an even bigger caricature than he is. Inside this travel agency, Mr. Dunphy tells Mr. Anderson that he still believes that he committed murder and he intends to put him away. Arthur points out that he cannot be tried for the same offense twice, and Dunphy says that Anderson will surely be married again, but he asserts that he will not this time. Mr. Anderson returns home. I'll add, set in a manor or chateau as we are here for a majority of the story. Five points. Inside, he runs into Felicity who didn't know he was returning so soon. She has the house in a state of disarray as she removes most of the items from view which could remind him of his deceased wife. He asks her whether what she said under oath was true. She admits it was not, but she felt bad for him under all the circumstances and doesn't believe he is guilty, and so she didn't want him to be convicted and sent away. L is for lies, five points. He asks her if she finds him to be a strange man, which she says no. How come? And he says that he simply doesn't feel anything regarding his wife's death. The house feels as empty as before. That night, Arthur decides to go into the attic where all the mementos of his previous wives are. Spiral staircase, five points. He plays through some picture slides he has of Gladys. Suddenly he hears splashing coming from his pool. He runs to the window and looks out. Sure enough, someone is swimming in the pool. He confronts the woman who is no apparition. It is Carol Baker. She acts coy about the fact that she just snuck onto someone else's property and hopped into their pool. He asks her if she's a journalist, and she asks him why he would be so important as to have people from the newspaper at his house at midnight. She claims she doesn't read the papers, implying she doesn't know who he is or what he was accused of. He continues to ask her to leave. She says her name is Julie Spencer and asks to be invited in for a drink, but he refuses her again. She leaves finally, after pointing out that she lives in the house across the lake, and if he calls on her for a drink, she'd oblige him. Julie pulls into her driveway, walks inside, the entire house is dark and seemingly abandoned. Adding to this is the fact that she lives in a tent set up in one of the rooms. She's either very quirky, or she is a squatter. Julie goes over to a phone and makes a call. On the wall behind her are newspaper clippings about Arthur. She says to the person on the line that she just met him. O is for obsession, five points, and K is for knives, five points. The next day, Julie is looking out over the lake. Animals featured birds and a horse, two points. Just as Arthur rides up to her, Julie gets in her car and leaves. He later drives by her gate, stops, but decides to keep going. He finds Julie sitting at the edge at the white cliffs of Dover. After a little back and forth, Julie admits that she did stop by his house deliberately to try and see him, and that she is aware of who he is from the newspapers. He flirts a little, stating that he did think to come by her house the other day, but practiced good impulse control. F is for fashion, five points. Back at Arthur's house, the two are having drinks. They talk briefly about the interior decorations, and Arthur observes that her house is rather big for one person. She asks for him to invite her over then, and he asks her about any immediate family. She says she has none, that her only sister had just died recently. And at this point, my red flag, red herring warning went off. She says she spent time at the house as a child, that she grew up in America and returned to the house to see if there was anything worthwhile remembering. There wasn't. She asks if he was happily married to Gladys, and he admits he was not, then asks her why she's here, and she asks, isn't it obvious? They smooch. Cut to nightfall, and this mysterious woman is standing outside of Julie's house. She slips into the shadows as the car pulls up. The woman startles Julie. She says she thought the house was for rent, but Julie says it is not, and that she lives here. The woman asks if it will be up for rent soon enough, and asks if she lives here alone. Julie says to the woman that she looks familiar, and this causes her to retreat. The next day, Julie visits the house but Felicity says that Mr. Anderson is not home, that he'll be abroad for a few months on a spur-of-the-moment trip, and that he instructed her not to tell anyone where, especially Julie. Julie demands to know. Cut to Julie cutting off Arthur before he can board the hovercraft ferry. She hops into his car. He says that he doesn't know whether she is from the police or the insurance company or not, but he can't get mixed up with her. 
She says that she doesn't care about what the newspapers might say about them, that she wants to be with him. They kiss as the hovercraft leaves. Julie tells Arthur that she made a life insurance policy with him as the beneficiary for 50,000 pounds as a sign of how much she trusts him. The same insurance company he has used in the past. She jokes that they should invite the directing manager to the wedding. They do, in fact, invite him to their wedding. Mr. Mitchell is asked by the priest if he could sign the book as witness to their union. The two return to the house to spend their honeymoon. She becomes immensely inquisitive about all the doors to all the rooms, prompting Arthur to ask her to stay out of the attic. Arthur grabs some champagne to bring for Julie, but he cannot find her. Julie is in the attic looking through all the stored mementos. She fumbles something which crashes, causing her whereabouts to be known. Arthur confronts her about snooping around the very area he had just told her to stay out of. He confronts her about who she truly is. Let go! Not until you tell me what you're looking for! You are hurting me! Hurting you! Y is for yelling. Extra for a hysterical woman. 10 points. Extra points for Q is for questions. For questions being yelled. Another 5 points. You know what? I'll actually let the scene play out. You deceitful little bitch, I ought to break your bloody neck! Is that what you did to Gladys? She's gonna be tasting iron for a while. Typical 1970s Italian misogyny, woman is slapped. Five points. She runs off. The next day, Arthur goes looking for Julie. A man working outside the property says she went towards the coast in a hurry. That same mystery woman returns and tells the man to remove the rent sign. Fuck it. I'm gonna do it. U is for undercover, five points. We don't know who she is, but there's no reason for her to be dressed like that. He finds her car at the cliffs of Dover, but she is not there. He uses a payphone somewhere west of London, judging by the signs, but notices Inspector Dunphy nearby. He gets the idea to drop by New Scotland Yard. Arthur tries to file a missing persons report for his wife, the whole time believing that Dunphy is up to something that he must have assigned Julie to set him up. Useless police or comedic police detective. Two points. The officer here tells him that the name Julie Spencer is a familiar name to him. He checks his files and finds something on a prior investigation. Julie had been accused of murdering her husband and sent to Dr. Shepard's clinic for being mentally ill. Arthur drops by the clinic inquiring for Dr. Shepard. This woman overhears him say that he is Julie's husband. With Dr. Shepard now, the doctor says that he had discharged her because she had responded well to her treatment. He believes that she did kill her husband, or at least let him die. He tells Arthur to wait at home for Julie to return and to act like nothing has happened. E is for eyeballs, five points. The woman gets Arthur's attention and asks about Julie, saying that the two had shared a room here. She says that Julie had told her that she would never get remarried, then warns Arthur to not let Julie go near the lake. Someone is mute or mentally impaired or senile or babbles. Two points. I don't know about you, but this qualifies to me. Arthur returns home and finds Dunphy inside playing around with one of Arthur's rifles. This is perhaps the most unprofessional superintendent of Scotland Yard character I have ever seen. Dunphy asks him where his wife is. He says he doesn't know, and that's why he called the police, but Dunphy accuses him of calling the police as a clever ruse. Julie, in fact, arrives home, which startles both men, particularly Dunphy, who leaves in a hurry. Arthur asks Julie where she was. She claims that she was shopping and that she had gone to the ocean this morning to swim. He presses her to tell the truth, but she stands by what she told him. Later in the evening, Julie says that she told Felicity to take the night off so the two of them could be alone. He eventually confronts her about why she never told him that she was married before. She asks how he found that out, and he tells her that he went by Dr. Shepard's. She says she is relieved they both know now, and asks if he heard about her killing her husband. Despite Arthur telling her that the doctor believes it was an accident, Julie feels guilty over his death and questions whether Arthur feels any remorse over Gladys' death, which he doesn't. She admits that she was fascinated by what she had read in the papers about him and wanted to meet him. In the past, she had been very depressed and wanted to end things, and maybe that's why she'd married him, because she often thinks about dying. He tells her that Dr. Shepard had suggested that someone look after Julie, which is exactly what he intends to do. He holds her and kisses her. Necking, five points. Cut to Julie in bed. She wakes up, checks to see if she is alone, then makes a call. 
She tells the person that she cannot go through with it, that she's too involved, that she's falling in love, and she needs to get out of here because she's afraid. Suddenly, Arthur walks in holding a rifle, asking her who she is talking to. He says he was cleaning his gun and was about to go shooting later, then confronts her who she was talking to and why she is afraid. She dodges the question, but he keeps pressing. She runs out, exclaiming she can't tell him. She runs to her car and takes off. Arthur follows her. Reckless driving, five points. Car chase, seven points. After a while, she crashes her car off the road. He recovers her and has her in bed. Arthur makes a call and we cut to downstairs where Dunphy is proving himself to be even more of an idiot and even more incompetent. He rings the buzzer, then after an insufficient time of waiting, moves around the house and commits a little B and E. Arthur comes down and watches the inspector break the law. Dunphy admits that he doesn't have a search warrant, but presumes to tell Mr. Anderson that he won't mind if the inspector and sergeant have a look around. Unlawful, inadmissible in court, this guy is a fucking idiot. He confronts Arthur, telling him that Julie's car was found in a county lane and that Arthur is getting sloppy and repeating himself, referring to the way that his first wife had died. He asks where his wife is, and Arthur tells him she's in the bedroom. The inspector, again shocked, runs upstairs to rescue the woman. Dunphy says to call an ambulance that he refuses to take Mr. Anderson's word for her being fine. The sergeant asks who the woman is. He says that this woman here is not Julie Spencer. He was the one who arrested Julie Spencer, and this woman in bed is not Julie Spencer. Dunphy demands to know where Mr. Anderson has hidden Julie Spencer, but he has no clue. We cut back to Julie's house and follow the mystery woman as she enters inside. Suddenly, a young woman, half naked, walks into the hallway and calls out saying that, your wife is here, as she giggles. Ladies and gentlemen, we are experiencing flashbacks. The woman looks around but finds the house empty. She sees two more women and follows them. In the next room, she finds more women sitting around a man who appears to be half naked. He calls out to her, Your wife's here. What shall we do? Nothing. Just ignore her. Get out of here, Julie. Can't you see I'm busy? As the real Julie continues to rummage about the old house, she finds a vision of herself walking through. H is for hallucinations. Five points. Julie follows the specter of herself upstairs. Just a quick heads up, I don't consider any of this to be supernatural. This is all obviously coming from Julie's mind and the movie is not attempting to suggest for a moment that this is a ghost. Just saying. Upstairs, she sees another flashback of the young women joking with her husband, Frank, about Julie. This vision of hers is interrupted by knocking at the front door. It is Dr. Shepard. On her way down, Julie picks up a dagger. She lets him in. Dr. Shepard asks why she has returned to the house and states that it is not good for her to dwell on that man, that she must look to her future. Julie stalks behind him, then plunges the dagger into him several times. Julie talks to the body and is clearly insane. Back at Mr. Anderson's, he tells Sergeant Bates that he had given his wife a sedative to sleep. He goes downstairs as Dunphy is getting off the phone. He tells Arthur what he already knows, that his wife is not Julie Spencer. What's more, he tells him that the chapel in which he got married has been closed for over 20 years and there is no Reverend Fowler in the entire county. The phone rings and Arthur answers it. It is the real Julie Spencer. Extra points for T is for telephone, for the killer making a call, another five points. She asks to speak to Julie. He asks who is calling and she says, Julie Spencer. She warns that Julie Spencer had killed her husband. He asks where she is calling from, and he is told the old house on the hill. He goes at once, but Dunphy tries to keep control of the situation. Honestly, I hate this man. He finally decides that he will go too, and so will Bates. But oh, it is okay. We have an officer outside the house who will make sure your wife is safe. Dumb. As the police car drives by, Julie gets out of a payphone and walks over, unabated, to the Anderson house. She gets to the door, but is stopped by this constable who asks her if she was sent by the doctor. She says, yes, and then he lets her in the house. Dumb. The officer then leaves and says he's going back to the station. Dum, 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 dum. She locks the doors and turns the lights out. Carol Baker wakes up and goes downstairs, calling out to Arthur. Close up on a door handle or creeping through an ajar door, five points. 
She is confronted by the real Julie. Carol Baker's character admits that she did rent Julie's house and impersonated her, but she had meant no harm. Julie says that she doesn't understand, for she thinks the other woman here is Julie. She says that she has come to help her to die because of all her guilt. She says no, her name is really Lillian. Lillian grabs a fireplace poker and hits Julie with it. She tries to flee the house. Julie jumps out from the shadows and cracks Lillian on the head, knocking her out cold. The men find the dead Dr. Shepard and no one else in the house. Arthur realizes that the doctor must have shown up here because he had told him that he and Julie were living together, but he never told him that it was at his manor. Arthur has to tell the inspector that the real Julie Spencer must have killed him and that they must find his wife to protect her. His wife is now missing. Two men walk in, Mr. Mitchell, the directing manager of the insurance company, and the man who was the priest. They say they had looked in the house but couldn't find anybody. They say that Lillian had called them. They go on to tell Arthur that his wife is not actually his wife. Her name is Lillian Martin, and she is the sister of Gladys Martin, his third wife. The whole charade was her idea to entrap Mr. Anderson, for she had believed that he must have killed her sister. Their marriage was a sham, and so they are not legally wed. She had impersonated Julie Spencer because the identity of a millionaires with a mysterious past would be perfect bait for Mr. Anderson to try and kill again. Arthur is determined to find the two women and rescue the woman he loves. He remembers the girl at the clinic had told him not to let her go near the lake. We cut to the two women on a boat in the lake. Julie Spencer is binding Lillian to an anchor. Lillian awakens and asks what is going on. Julie says that she is helping her to die in the same manner that Frank died. Lillian tries to say that she is not Julie, that she never knew Frank, but the real Julie states how she had murdered Frank. He was drunk, then tied to an anchor and pushed into the lake, and she refused to pull him out. Hidden identity of the killer until the final moments. Five points. Julie tells her that Frank is waiting and tosses the anchor into the lake, but the rope snags onto Julie and pulls her beneath the water. Lillian is able to stop herself from plunging in by getting herself caught on the rigging. The killer dies accidentally. I only have it for gunshot or falling, but I will add this caveat for drowning in, say, four points. The cop car pulls up and we cut to later. Dunphy now approves of the couple, and Mitchell, the directing manager, offers them up a 150,000 pound insurance policy, but Arthur doesn't want it, but Lillian does. She says it is in both their names. It is a joint policy. If anything would happen to either of them, the other one would collect. The movie ends with them driving off happily in love. There's a silly back and forth with Dunphy, Mitchell, and Felicity that feels like it is the end of a TV movie. Whatever. The movie cuts to black, and then like 20 seconds later, the end flashes. Quickly add extra points for O is for obsession for either the killer or the sleuth being obsessed. Another five points. S is for secrets, extra points for the killer having an impossible to predict motivation, 10 points. And someone else is believed to be the killer. Mistaken identity. Five points. And that's the fourth victim. Well, I enjoyed this. I didn't love it, but I certainly went along for the ride. I've seen several Jally that are worse and many more that are better. I accept now that the movie just leaves all the prior deaths as coincidences, but it felt like for so long, to me, it was going to reveal that Felicity was involved or something. I mentioned in the viewing that the Julie Spencer plot in the final act feels a bit tacked on and that it kind of comes off as the two plots being from separate movies or another way I had put it, it feels like they are from the same movie, but it would then seem like chunks of the story were cut out to streamline the movie's runtime. Like, I, I could believe that the whole first plot of the movie and the last 30 minutes are part of the same greater story, but it feels like it would be a mini-series or something. And for the purpose of this movie, they were like, well, I'll just cut everything out. We can still keep the ending. Let's segue to the Jolly Tally cliches for this movie. post Jallo viewing cliches. The reason for the killing. Mental illness, psychopathy, or obsession. Seven points. The reason for the investigation. Okay, so this one is interesting. Yes to the police investigation. Yes also to a private investigation. No to suspect trying to prove innocence because Arthur never really is doing that. 
but a final yes to revenge or obsession due to losing someone to the killer for Lillian. Her sister wasn't actually murdered, but the audience and Lillian don't know that definitively until the end. And since I can only pick one, I will pick the one worth the most, which is that. 10 points. And extra points for Amateur Sleuth, another 5 points. Bonus points, the style bonus. The movie is stylish enough in terms of Jello films. Honestly, nothing too crazy. I didn't observe any POVs, but we had a couple of zooms and crash zooms and fade effects, particularly when Lillian was passing out. Not a lot. Out of a max total of 25 points, I will give the fourth victim eight points for its style bonus. Soundtrack. <laughs> Piero Umiliani did it, and it does sound like a rehashed version of Five Dolls for an August Moon a little bit. Yes, 15 points. Bad effects? No, no, no points. Final look, extra points. The Deadpool tallying how many kills and deaths are featured in the film. I break it down as thus, 10 points per kill or death scene for the main Deadpool, plus any stylistic kill multipliers, which we didn't add yet, plus the knife kill bonus. We have Gladys Anderson. She appears to drown, but we find out during the trial that she was dead before that from an overdose. 10 points. Dr. Shepard, stabbed or impaled with a knife, 21 points. Julie Spencer, Drowned, 14 points. Extended Deadpool for those other deaths mentioned but not seen. I'll give three points for each. We have Mrs. Anderson, one, three points. Mrs. Anderson, two, three points. And Frank, three points. I will say there are a few throwaway lines in the movie, like the barrister and the judge also being widowers, but these types of lines, I, I really don't count. Red herrings for the total number of legitimate suspects in the film. Five points per legit suspect are awarded. We have Arthur Anderson, Felicity Downing, Lillian Martin, Julie Spencer. 20 points for red herrings. Flashback sequences, five points each. We have one, two, three, and four for a total of 20 points for flashbacks. Nudity, I award five points for ass, seven for breasts, and 10 for genitalia, none. Ladies and gentlemen, for the fourth victim, I awarded the film an AZ score of 13 out of 26. With the bonus points for these, we have a modified score total of 95 points. And for the full Jally Tally score, I award the fourth victim a Jally Tally score of 359 points. And I finally nail my prediction. Compared to A Lizard in a Woman's Skin in first with 762 points, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward in second with 728 points, and a Quiet Place to Kill in third with 579 points, the fourth victim is currently in 16th place behind Death Laid an Egg and above The Possessed. I predicted that the movie would end up getting around 350 to 400 points, so I am finally satisfied. But like I've stated before, these points don't mean a movie is better or worse. Please like this video, share it with your friends if they are horror fans or cinephiles, subscribe here to The King and Jallo if you haven't yet, and if you have any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns, leave those below in the comment section and I will get back to you. 
Give the King and Jallo a follow on Instagram and a like on Facebook. Subscribe to the King and Jallo Patreon to see early access to my videos with some videos able to be seen up to three weeks in advance. Plus exclusive content found only there such as the viewings and very soon there will be podcasts, let's plays for Jallo inspired games and book reviews for Jallo inspired books. Next time on The King and Jallo will be the overview, review, and jally tally for the second Dario Argento Jallo film, The Cat o' Nine Tales. Thank you very much, one and all, for your continued support. This is Tanner Leeser for The King and Jallo, and if nothing else, I hope to see you next time. you looking at? Who's that man? He's the one and only man I admire. He's had three wives, dear. And he got rid of them all. And it made him rich. Your bloody Ooh. neck! Oh! You know what you did to Gladys? Oh! Oh my god! He's acting aggressive! I thought I told you to shut up! <laughs>